Good morning, Sonoma Valley Community Church and friends. We're so glad to see you this morning. Welcome and come on in to the sanctuary of SVCC. We're glad that you have taken time today to watch this virtual service, but you know, it's not just virtual. It is real. It is something that we can experience through the Holy Spirit in the now time. It's not just something that happened or something that will happen. It's happening in the now time. And I'm wondering what's happening in your time, in your now time right now as you're just turning this on. Maybe you're coming to this worship service and you're needing some encouragement. Maybe you're wondering if your prayers are reaching past the ceiling in the room that you're in and touching the heart of God. I'd like to encourage you this morning to join with us as we learn together about the kind of prayer that works as we worship God, as we seek his face, and as we partake in communion. You know, the whole purpose of worshiping God on Sunday mornings is to grow more intimacy between us and God. Think about that, intimacy. We crave it, we're afraid of it. Some people are feeling very lonely, socially distancing and missing out on the the connectivity on the warm hugs on the sense that somebody really loves you and is squeezing you for all your worth because they just so happy to have you in their lives i want to let you know that god loves you that god is interested in squeezing your life with his love letting his love wrap you around you no matter what your circumstances are you may be in a hospital you may be on the front lines of, of uh, working with people. You may be back home right now and uh, relaxing because you've had a hard week. I wanna invite you to turn your heart to God and let God's love speak to you this morning. Mm-hmm. And with that, I'd like to invite you, if you will, to join with me in a word of prayer as we just open this service up and invite God's presence, God's <laughs> love, and God's grace. Mm-hmm. Would you join me, please? Lord God, we pray for your favor in our lives, that we might learn how to pray as we should, that we might learn how to seek your heart and seek your face, and that we might receive answers from heaven that touch the need of human beings on earth. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to pray in a manner that is able to reach your heart and mind and that we might be receptive to learning and listening and finding intimacy with the living God. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord God, that you would bless this service. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord God, that you would move in people's lives and in their homes and in their marriages Mm -hmm. and in their parenting and in their concerns that they carry with them day in and day out. Mm -hmm. Lord, help us to find a place of joy that comes when our hearts are at rest Mm -hmm. and glad because you are speaking into our lives. We pray for your favor and blessing on this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen Amen and amen. So we'd like to begin this service this morning, not only praying and welcoming you, but also with a devotion from Sarah Young. Yes, Sarah Young. I've been reading these devotions uh, with my wife on a daily basis, uh, but this one seems particularly appropriate for today. She writes, trusting me, is the alternative to falling into despair or escaping into unreality. When you're in the midst of adversity, it can be hard to think clearly. Yet this is when it's vitally important to make wise decisions. Sometimes it's as if choices are swirling around you, waiting for you to grab onto the right one. However, there is one choice that is always appropriate and always effective, the decision to trust me with all your heart and mind. If you're on the verge of sliding into the depths of despair, stop and declare your trust in me. Whisper it, speak it, shout it. Spend some time thinking about all the reasons you have been you have for being confident in me. Remember and rejoice in my endless, unfailing love for you. 
If you've been numbing your pain through denial of reality, expressing your trust can bring you into contact with ultimate reality, me. Confide in me, beloved, for I am infinitely knowing. I understand everything about your circumstances and I will help you. Proverbs 3, 5, lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind, and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. Mm -hmm. Psalm 52, 8, but I am like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. Mm -hmm. And Isaiah 41, 13, for I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Isaiah 41, 13. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Amen. So if you would please put on your singing hat. Nobody's gonna be critiquing your singing today. And join with us as we talk, as we sing about our thirst for the living God through the song as the deer and come let us worship and bow down. Charlotte's going to sing and I'm going to play this little harmonica as best I can. So let's invite the Lord to speak into our worship. worship and bow down for he is the shepherd and we are the sheep of his pasture lord i pray that you would speak your love and your intimacy into our hearts right now and we're also going to sing about the steadfast love of the lord would you join us please The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. Great is your faith. Sing it with us again. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. 
Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. Great is your faithfulness. You know, I just remember that I've been married to my wife almost 33 years, and there's been faithfulness between us, not only unto the Lord, but between each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great song to sing, to just remind ourselves that the faithfulness of God in our lives can promote faithfulness between us and between people. And I pray that God's faithfulness will be a blessing to you this morning. We also want to share some announcements with people. You know, maybe you've been a little afraid to use the modern technology of the internet to connect with us, but I wanna invite you, if you're listening to this service, to find our website at www.welovesonoma.com. Isn't that a great phrase? God bless us with the ability to get a new URL. That's www.welovesonoma.com. And you can also write me at info at welovesonoma.com. Now that's just the beginning of connecting with us. Once you get onto the website, you're going to find all sorts of different pages and information. One of the newest pages is our In Memory page, which celebrates the lives of people who have been a part of our church, but who have now transitioned on to heaven. Mm -hmm. And one of the latest people to have passed away was Bob Bayless. You can find his name and a connection to his website that talks about his life on and through our website. So I wanna encourage you to go find that page In Memory and then go explore what, what's there for, for you in terms of the beautiful, wonderful celebrations of life that have already taken place since I've had the privilege of being a pastor here. There's another page that's also on the uh, website um, that, that reflects the opportunity for you to see these worship services after the fact through YouTube. All you need to do is connect onto that YouTube channel and you will see all the different sermons, all the different videos that have been done. So far, I believe there's eight different videos that have been done and we've had an average of 60 people watching every one of them. I gotta tell you, that may not seem like a lot for those of you who are used to the much larger churches, but for our church, it's three times the number <laughs> that we, we had when I first started coming. And beyond that, uh, every one of those people who's watching is a precious person, is a precious person who may have had other people join them in watching. They may have had a watch party. And we don't know where all those people are living or what's happening in their lives, but I wanna welcome you as friends of Sonoma Valley Community Church to be part of connecting with us through the website. If you have a testimony of what God is doing in your life, of something that's happening or has happened that's a victory or a breakthrough that you've had with God or an answer to prayer that's just dramatic, I wanna invite you to uh, write about that and send that to me so that I can post that or if not posting it, at least maybe share it with the, the staff and with the leadership and the people of our church. Because we wanna build encouraging life testimonies of what God is doing in our lives. We also want to pray this morning for some of the people in our church who are struggling with health concerns. Uh, this morning when we want to pray for Terry Turpin who needs healing. She's back in the hospital and I want to invite you who know Terry to pray for her right now as, as I'll be praying in a moment. She's having problem breathing and some other things and we, we just want to ask God to have mercy upon her and strengthen her body and bring her back to her family and friends. We want to be praying for Arlene, who's still recovering from her knee surgery, for Christina, who is uh, who has uh, had a little uh, uh, hiccup in her in her healing of her throat. Uh, she's got a new infection, and we're praying that God will just remove that infection and that uh, God will uh, heal the ligaments and all that's, that's a part of the surgery that she's had in her throat. Mm -hmm. We also wanna praise God and pr continue to pray for Blake, who uh, when we saw him a couple weeks ago, 
uh, outside. Uh, he was planting some uh, flowers in his backyard. And, uh, and what was interesting is I asked him, how's your shoulder doing from soldier, soldier, shoulder surgery? He raised his arm up like this. And we were just praising God because, you know, having shoulder surgery doesn't mean you immediately get your arm up, but he was able to do it. So we're pretty excited about that. Also want to pray for uh, the Perrys who are uh, serving in a hospital setting and for all those of you who are involved in hospitals. I know my wife is involved in the medical profession, but she's working mostly from home. And so we want to pray for all those who are on the front lines as first responders here in Sonoma. We also want to just remind you that prayer is working, uh, that God is listening here in Sonoma. We've not had a single increase in a death related to coronavirus in, I believe, the last two months. So God is, is hearing. I know there are other places where God is also working with people and, and that, um, that, the, that the virus is starting to play itself out. And so we pray that God would speak to our hearts and help us to hear his voice in the midst of this challenging time. Would you join with me in prayer for our dear friends? Lord God, we pray for Terry and Arlene and Blake and Christine. And we pray, Lord God, that you would have your healing hand upon all four of them. We pray especially, Lord, for Terry, who's in a critical condition. And we ask, Lord God, that you would be with her uh, as she's in the hospital. Lord, help her to find the strength and to rally and to to reduce any infection or inflammation in her lungs. We pray also, Lord God, with, with thanks for the victories that people are having in our church. Lord, I'm praying for new jobs. I'm praying for a new income. I'm praying for new direction, and I'm praying for favor upon the people of Sonoma Valley Community Church and all our friends here in this community and around the world. And I also want to pray, Lord God, for our missionaries. I had the privilege this week to talk to John Opgenoff of, of Word of Hope. And, uh, and what an encouragement he is as a missionary around the world, spreading the gospel. And we want to pray for our missionaries that you would be encouraging them and blessing them in their work as they are serving Christ around the world. Mm -hmm. Lord, bless the rest of this service, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'd like to also invite you to join with me in supporting the ministries of this church. Um, as the camera follows, you'll see my check. And you know, I've been, I've been giving by way of the website. We have a giving page. You can give that way, or you can put a, a, a little check through the door slot of our church, or you can find it, help it to find its way into our offering box. But that's just to remind you that it is important for us between our walk with God to make sure that money is not controlling us, but that we recognize that the Lord owns everything that we have and that we have the privilege to generate profit for the Lord and to give some of what we have been blessed with back to the Lord's work here in our world and here in Sonoma. So with that, I want to invite you to pull out a checkbook, pull out a uh, your smartphone or whatever it is that is the means by which you're going to connect with our church and to, and to send some funds that is a gift from God to you to be a channel of blessing to others. Also want to invite you to uh, join with me right now. I'm going to grab this check, I mean this glass. I'm going to grab my glasses and we're going to go over here and we're going to hear the word of the Lord. Open your Bibles if you have them, I hope you do, to Luke chapter 18. We're continuing our series that we've been doing on the parables of our lives. And this morning we're going to look at the parables on prayer that works. Parables on prayer that works. And we're looking at chapter 18 of the Gospel of Luke, Luke 18 verses 1 to 14. So if you have your Bibles, please follow along with me. Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. 
man, that, that could be said today. That's like 2,000 years ago that was written. And that is as modern and as clear a language as you can get. Everybody understands what's being said there. Verse two, saying, in a certain city, there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while, he was unwilling. But afterward, he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man. Wow, he's honest. Yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he, I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to, into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector was even unwilling to lift up his high eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went into his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Well, this morning we come to a section of Luke's gospel where Jesus helps his listeners to focus on prayer that works, to better appreciate that prayer works better from a position of, and this is counterintuitive, deficiency. From God's point of view, things are not necessarily what they seem to be on the surface of our lives. There is a needful answer for a widow and a future for a wicked tax collector who sues God for mercy. And there's also a reconsideration by a wicked judge and a rebuff for a pious Pharisee who confidently dismisses all others in his sense of exclusive claim upon the good pleasure of God. What a surprise these parables pack. Ultimately, God is somewhat inscrutable and uncontrollable in terms of his sovereign choices to graciously pursue and bless those who are troubled, marginalized, poor, blind, crippled, homeless, and dishonored in mainstream society. It seems almost that being someone with substantial financial or social capital means that you have a severe stumbling block when it comes to having a productive relationship with God. If you have nothing, you're closer to God than if you have a whole lot of something. And if you have a whole lot of something, you might be missing out on everything that God has for you. And that's why Jesus is talking to us about prayer. He doesn't want anybody, anybody to miss out on how to be productive in your prayer life. So one wonders what the secrets are to prayer that works if those who are prominent in society are not effective in their prayers, typically. Lots of people around the world are praying. Many are praying today that God will listen to their prayers and bring them customized answers that express comfort and provision and validation to become successful. But Jesus wants to speak on the topic of prayer. 
because people have problems that overwhelm them, not just to like help them be more successful. And because he wants us to turn our thoughts to God as a provider of solutions to people who are persistent and humble. If you were to boil my whole message down this morning from these two parables, it would be be persistent and be humble if you want your prayers to hear and reach the heart of God. Ultimately, and unfortunately, we often are tempted to tell God what the solution should look like. And we sometimes try to bargain with God about his timing in answering our petitions. Well, this morning, Jesus speaks two parables into our hearts and minds to help us to get going again if we have failed to take advantage of prayer that works. Jesus wants everyone to pray regularly and effectively because the kingdom of God is at hand. Prayer is God's way of helping us partner with him to sort out our lives while we still can and to experience the intimacy that God has for us. Let's take a closer look. Parable one is the parable about the persistent widow. The successful persistence of a widow before an unjust judge opens the door for believing that personal vindication comes through those who have faith enough to insist on a meaningful answer from the living God. What do all those words boil down to? It means that if you really want to hear from God, you're going to have to pray more than once. You're going to have to pursue God's heart, God's mind. You're going to have to look into scripture. You're going to have to pray the scripture. You're going to have to pray and with passion and with persistence to reach the heart of God. Is that because God doesn't hear well? No, it's not because God can't hear you the first time. It's because when we are praying, when we are seeking God's face, God is doing something in our lives to help us be ready to receive the answer that he has for us. Let me ask you a personal question. When was the last time that you wrote down a prayer request? A written down prayer request is a faith gesture that your prayer is worthy of consideration. And what can be more worthy of prayerful consideration over time than where your soul is going to spend in its eternity? And when it comes to less important but valuable prayer requests, how do, you, how do you keep track of your prayers before God if you don't make it a habit to write some of them down? As we welcome this prayerable into our minds, we realize that it must have been a consuming prayer request for this widow to pursue the judge for an answer that would help her, an answer that was right. We note that Jesus, through this parable, is making a how much more argument. How much more can the living God be relied upon to provide vindication and answers how much more can God do that than a wicked judge in our story? One who is, despite his wickedness, facing the prospect of embarrassment and then is forced to do his job to deliver justice, even by a lowly and impoverished widow. Now, God doesn't let us yank his chain and, and, because, and just let us tell him whatever we want and then and then he does all of it, like, like a Coke machine. You stick the money in the machine and out comes the Coke. No, God listens, listens deeply to everything that's going on in our lives, both in the past and in the present and also in the future. Now Luke announces the thrust of the parable as encouragement to persist in prayer to God. It, the passage reads, now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. Sometimes people lose heart in praying. But it's clear from the context that this prayer uh, is about an end time resolution of the problems of the present and not simply about answer prayer in the normal sense. What will be the overall verdict of our lives and what it seems like might be an adverse verdict. I mean, if, if you go before a judge, it's a scary thing. 
You're thinking that they're going to maybe may render a verdict that will ruin your life or that will have consequences that can't be undone. And, uh, you know, we wonder sometimes, what does God really think of me? Well, the overall verdict of our lives is in the hands of God. And this widow may have been a character who refused to believe that her husband had died as punishment from God over her life for something she may or may not have done. You know, sometimes we blame ourselves for the most horrendous things. The parable is not specific, but she seems to have had few resources and no husband to lean on to meet life's common challenges. She was probably alone without family and may have been beyond marriageable age. And it may have been that she felt the weight of false guilt and shame heaped upon her life by those who knew her before her becoming a widow. Do you have something in your life that you think people blame you about? Or something that you feel embarrassed about? Bring it to God in prayer. You know, vindication is a sweet thing. When you get vindication, you have been proven right or justified in doing something. Everyone accused of a crime craves vindication. Vindication is good if it speaks the truth about who you are, but it can only come after something bad, like being accused of doing something you didn't do. The widow is crying out for vindication. She's being squeezed by life circumstances to plead her case before a judge who could care less until the exposure of his wickedness becomes potential public embarrassment. As a public official, public embarrassment is the most undesirable exposure or punishment you can have. He is not going to let a widow turn him into a point of unkind laughter. And so he decides to do his job and publish the truth about the widow and render a, a favorable verdict and to free her from any accusation and to protect her reputation. She is worthy of a not guilty verdict and to be treated as an honorable part of society and to enjoy the benefits of such a verdict. And the traction of her life is not only resting on the possibility of affecting the public rep reputation of the judge, who is indeed wicked and admits it, it's her persistence of faith and action in a tireless way to get the result that she's looking for that becomes a turning point of Jesus's parable. If God is not intractable like this wicked judge, then will he not also provide a solution in timely fashion because he is willing to promote justice and resolve the pain of his people? I think this issue of persistence of faith that a vindication of one's person will happen is directly tied to our personal salvation. In verse 8, we learn that God is long-suffering and concerned to vindicate his people. Will he find faith when Jesus comes back? At the University of Santa Clara, where I attended for a couple of years, years ago, there's a very large wooden cross standing in front of the historic Mission Chapel. I mean, it's huge. You can't miss it. But you can miss the words that are etched on it. They come from Matthew 24, 13. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Persistence, salvation, tied together. If we're going to be saved, it's not just a one moment thing. It's, it's persisting with God. It's growing intimacy with God. It's, it's seeking to learn how to pray the way that he is teaching us. The following verse says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. I'm not saying that salvation comes by earning through good works. I'm saying that a real life faith builds a real life prayer life. And a real life, real faith in Christ will build 
a life of good works that God is pleased with and that we're called to persist, persist in your walk with God, even during these times. We also read in James chapter 1, verses 12, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. God wants to reward you and bless you as you persevere under trial. And he will give us the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So how, how is persistence working out in our prayers, in my prayers? Well, my wife and I have been praying for our son, who just turned 21 last month, that he would be gaining all the life skills necessary to persist through college. And he's half a world away in London. Mom and dad can't step in and rescue him in any way. And we've been praying and asking for God's favor and that he would not uh, go cuckoo during this time of, of shelter in place. And you know, my son on his own picked up four classes to do on the internet and he has completed his major project and his professor just announced to all the young people that are part of his major that my son and, a, and an associate have been blessed to provide all the branding for the university for the coming year. It's a tremendous honor and it blows me away that my son has been hustling and working from his studio apartment during the two months that he's been under quarantine. And it just shows me that I can't do a single thing to help my son, but I can pray for him. And my wife has been praying for him. And God is building character in my son's life. And we're just so blessed and grateful for that privilege as parents. Prayer can change things. Prayer can change the world. Well, let's move on to the second parable. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Both of them are at prayer and it reminds us that the vindication of our life before God is based on God's mercy and not upon our own judgmental perspective that dangerously takes the place of God's perspective. Here, the matter of prayer that works is not our faithfulness or tireless obedience to rituals. It's not about that you pray every morning at 5 a.m. until 7 a.m. or whatever your ritual might be. Rather, prayer that works is rooted in a cultivation and disposition of felt need before God. We can't exactly be sure what is so objectionable about this Pharisee if we just look at the clues of his life. I don't know about you, but it'd be a cruel thing to be judged just about the ideas inside my head. I mean, it's not like just your thoughts make all the difference. It's also your thoughts connected to your actions. But here is this Pharisee being exposed by Jesus through this parable. And, and how should the Pharisee's prayer strike us? Well, he seems to be a figure of a pious man. But on closer examination, he's also a man of pride and hypocrisy who promotes himself before God in a quite blatant way. It's not that his thoughts and his prayers are just evilly located in just him. It's that he's telling God how God should look at him, how God should treat him, and how he somehow deserves and obligates God to act towards him in a way that God is not acting towards a tax gatherer. Now, presumably, he tells the truth about the way he lives his life. And he does seem to see most other people as beneath his level of attainment. It seems that he thinks that most other people are some kind of degradation, I don't know. The disparaging and offhanded dismissal of the tax gap collector counts against our sympathy as well. I mean, who wants to be friends with a tax gatherer? And obviously, you could imagine the man to be a problem in all sorts of ways. And yet it seems 
that God has a different evaluation. The tax gatherer's prayer seems piercing with pain and authentic in aspiration. The depth of feeling expressed by his appeal and posture and action means that our hearts must go out to him. He's not referencing himself as better than anyone else. Rather, he is aware that he is standing in the need of forgiveness. Interestingly, he has perhaps not lived an entire life of being pleasing to God. An entire life may have been wasted before God and people in his region by him being in the business of inflating taxes and living off the misery of people who are his people by extorting them on behalf of the Roman government. He was no friend of the people of God. He made their lives harder year by year, but now comes the turn, the moment when he faces the living God and comes to an end to himself. He humbles himself and he discovers that God extends mercy and forgiveness for a man who's done little to deserve it. He's not the same man anymore who extorted his fellow Jews. He's a different man, a man of repentance and a man of contrite spirit who has awakened to the voice of God's voice speaking to his soul. He cannot bring himself to continue his lifestyle of advantage. He has decided to follow Jesus, not unlike Matthew, the apostle. Among the early followers and apostles of Jesus, Matthew is mentioned in Matthew 9, 9 and 10, 3 as a publican or tax collector who while sitting at the receipt of custom in Capernaum was called to follow Jesus. He's also listed among the 12, but without identification of his background in Mark, Luke, and Acts. In these passages and others, he is seen as the tax collector Levi, the son of Alphaeus, but Mark and Luke never explicitly equate this Levi with the Matthew named as one of the 12, but I think he probably is. According to the Gospels, Matthew was a first century Galilean, presumably born in Galilee, which is not part of Judea or the Roman Idiaea province. As a tax collector, he would have been literate in Aramaic and Greek and Latin. His fellow Jews would have despised him for what was seen as collaborating with the Roman occupation force. So this is a smart man, but this is a man who is strategic in stealing from his fellow countrymen. Well, after his call, Matthew invites Jesus home for a feast. On seeing this, the scribes and the Pharisees criticized Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners. This prompted Jesus to answer, I did not call, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The New Testament records that as a disciple, he followed Jesus, and he was one of the witnesses of the ascension of Jesus. Afterwards, the disciples withdrew in the upper room in Jerusalem, and Matthew was with them. And the disciples remained in and around Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came upon them. Matthew experienced everything that all the other apostles did and more. Now imagine being a tax gatherer who later come, becomes a disciple and apostle of Jesus Christ and hearing this parable. This parable of a tax collector begging God for mercy, asking God to help him, asking God to, to forgive him and to allow him to experience intimacy that he has no right to deserve. Maybe a little bit of Matthew is in all of us. Where does this leave us? Simply this, if we want our prayers to be effective, they're going to need to be part of us humbling ourselves and also persisting with our prayers. Yes, God hears all our prayers, but it seems that God answers prayers according to how he sees into our lives. 
and how he evaluates the disposition of our values and private thoughts about him and about ourselves and about the people in our lives. If we live with compassion, God will offer compassion. If we live with hardness of heart, our prayers will fail to rise past the ceiling. May God open our hearts to hear his voice and answers, answer our deepest prayers on behalf of not only ourselves, but also our prayers for others. I'd like to close with a little passage from this book, Purpose in Prayer by E.M. Bounds. He wrote this, these men prayed with a purpose. To them, God was not far away in some inaccessible region, but near at hand, ever ready to listen to the call of his children. There was no barrier between them. They were on terms of perfect intimacy, if one may use such a phrase in relation to man and his maker. No cloud obscured, obscured the face of the father from his trusting child, who could look up into the divine countenance and pour out the longings of his heart. And that is the type of prayer which God never feels to hear. He knows that it comes from a heart at one with his own, from one who is entirely yielded to the heavenly plan. And so he bends his ear and gives to the pleading child the assurance that his petition has been heard and answered. If we want answers to our prayers, they need to come from the heart of who we are so that they can touch the heart of who God is. Will you pray with me? Lord God, I'm standing in the need of forgiveness. I'm standing in the need for intimacy with you. And sometimes I'm just consumed with trying to be successful or trying to be something that I imagine people want me to be instead of pouring my heart out to you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would speak your love into everyone who hears this sermon, everyone who is in earshot of this message. Lord God, you are there and ready to answer prayer if it's truly coming from our heart. Lord, help us to pour our hearts out before you and to do so with the wisdom of Scripture and to pray in Christ and pray with the invitation of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to change history and to change lives through prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I'd like to invite you to join with me in having some communion. We wanna share the love and the presence and the intimacy of Jesus Christ by going to the communion table. Would you join me? These beautiful candles remind us of the light of Jesus Christ in our lives. I have a little bread here. Have a little wine. And they symbolize the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. I like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I'm going to do this in my remembrance of Christ and invite you to join with me. We all partake now together. May God bless 
as we feed on Christ by faith. Lord God, may you bless those who are partaking in communion. Lord, bless the friends and family of Sonoma Valley Community Church. Lord God, feed our faith with your love, with your grace, and your forgiveness. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Please forgive me my sins. Lord, I'm not worthy even to be a pastor. I beg of you to have mercy on the earth with regards to this pandemic. I pray, Lord God, that you would keep all the friends and family of Sonoma Valley Community Church safe from this virus. I pray, Lord God, that you would touch our hearts about the need to be on our knees before you in prayer. I pray, Lord God, that you would touch hearts and minds through your Holy Spirit to seek your face and to seek your heart and your mind about the petitions that are on our hearts and minds. Lord God, I pray that you would speak joy into our hearts and purpose for prayer. Lord, help us do the work of prayer because you are drawing close to us as we draw close to you. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Thank you for him dying for our sins. Thank you for our salvation through the grace of God through the sacrifice of Jesus. And thank you for the resurrection, that Jesus has risen from the grave and that we can have hope and salvation because God loves us and has called us to be with him for eternity. Lord, we pray that you would help us be a channel of blessing, help us to love people deeply from the heart. Forgive us where we fail to think about others before we think about ourselves. Forgive us where we say unkind words. Forgive us where we, where we miss the mark. Lord, help us to manage our lives during these uncertain times with an unshakable trust and faith in what you're doing in our lives and in this church and in this community and in this world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Would you please join with me as we go back and sing a closing song together? I wanna to invite you to make it real, make it real with God. Make your relationship with God real. Talk to him. Tell him you love him. Tell him you need him. Tell him that you've been away from him for a while, but you're now wanting to start over and start fresh. Give God a chance to speak into your life. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless you, and have a great week in Jesus as you're praying for God to do new things in your life. God bless you.